Hello there. Welcome to Book Talk. This is Anthony, and I'm your host today. And uh, I'm wondering, are you in business? Or are you contemplating of being in business at some point in your life? <laughs> if you are not right now, then this is your episode because we have someone who is an entrepreneur and not only an entrepreneur, he knows and he likes helping other entrepreneurs. So I'm going to introduce to you Bobby Albert. Welcome to the show, Bobby. Well, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be on your show today. Yes, we are really honored to have you here. And for the viewer to know, uh, Bobby Albert is an entrepreneur, as I said, as I said before, but and he's uh, been with 12 companies and uh, acquired, he started 12 companies and acquired others nine and has grown a business from five employees into over 150 uh, member. Uh, and he is still continuing to teach other people. He is an author, he is a speaker, he is a, a coach, and he's written three books being the author. And today we are going to be looking at one which is known as True North Business. So I believe we are going to have a great time and not only, not only a great time, we are going to have some insight that is going to help you in your entrepreneurship journey. Now, as uh, John Maxwell said, everything starts and, and ends on leadership. And so it's very important, whatever it is that you plan to do in business, to imagine yourself being a leader and a competent and uh, fluent leader. So we are blessed to have Bobby with us here. Welcome. And uh, let's continue. Let us get to know a bit more uh, about you, Bobby. Well, uh, perhaps maybe I uh, can uh, share this. And it's interesting you bring up about John Maxwell because uh, I've become a friend of John Maxwell. I was actually, uh, uh, I was one of 16 people that he mentored for a whole year. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, it was a pleasure to be under his mentorship. But Perhaps I can share this with you is that when I was 20 years old, life was good. Yeah. I had just graduated from our local university. I became engaged to marry my wife. Life was indeed very good. And, but there is one evening I will never forget. Uh, I was playing foosball with my college buddies. When a friend came up to me and said, Bobby, your dad's in the emergency room. He had a heart attack. So we rushed to the hospital and upon seeing. Oh, I think we have a deep breath and said. Sorry, I think we had a connection issue. Let, yeah, go on, go on. Uh, he drew in a deep breath and said, I, could, I couldn't save him. Well, my mom and I were absolutely stunned. In an instant, I became the leader of our small five-employee business. Soon I discovered we were heavy in debt. All the debt was short-term. In other words, it was due in less than a year. And our debt was about the same as our total gross revenue. Not good. I mean, financially, we were way upside down. Mm -hmm. I was in crisis mode every day, much like we're all experiencing today during these challenging health and economic times. And however, we survived and thrived and ultimately grew to over 150 employees like you mentioned Anthony mm -hmm. and but I, I learned that through those tough times that everyone can build a successful life and a business and uh, uh, by applying 
leadership principles and practices uh, in not only in their life, but all in their family, but also in their uh, in their business. Mm, yeah, and, and that is very important. Uh, I mean, when you can be having that uh, principles, those principles and those values that are going to take you through some challenging times, especially like we are observing right now in uh, through the pandemic. Yeah. And uh, if you can come out shining from those challenging times, then you come out with lessons that you are able to share with others to get them through that. And so uh, how did you how did you consider that you found yourself in a business that uh, had some debt that is equivalent to your overall value of your business? Well, uh, you know, uh, I sold my uh, company in 2011. Mm -hmm to a publicly traded company on the stock market. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we were very fortunate that from 2005 to 2011, uh, we experienced uh, revenue and profit growth of 500% mm -hmm. during that time period, which is yeah. extraordinary. And that was during the time with, with they call here in the United States, they call the Great Recession, mm -hmm. uh, because from late 07, 08, uh, 2000, you know, 9, 2010, uh, the economy, uh, I know here, especially in the United States, was it was in the tank. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people lost their business or lost their jobs during that time period. But sti still at that, we grew our company uh, by 500% in revenue and profits. Yeah. And, and when I sold my company in 2011, I, I, I started what I call today my second half of life. Mm -hmm. uh, because for years, I mean, for many years, uh, I was in, you know, trade associations, uh, across the country was asking me to come in and speak and, uh, to teach on the, my leadership style and on our workplace culture that we had, uh, in my, in my company, uh, because our culture was, if I can maybe say this, was like our secret sauce mm -hmm. uh, in, in our company. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I sold a company, if you came uh, to our place of business and walked around and talked to the employees, they would, they would talk with you as though they own the company and not Bobby Albert. Yeah. And you, you just can't buy that stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you know, that has to build over time uh, to be able to develop a culture where people uh, really, when they came to work every day, they came to work with, you know, excitement, with enthusiasm, with a passion, and uh, they actually desired to show up every day. Yeah. And, and, and I tell you what, I talked to a lot of business people business leaders, you know, they're having a hard time getting employees to show up. They're, you know, especially nowadays, uh, a hard time finding people. They're losing some of their best employees uh, or going off, you know, to another job or, you know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I am coaching, uh, it, you know, leaders, business leaders, uh, typically, when, when they call me up, usually the first thing that they say, they say, Bobby, uh, I want you, I, I, I want you to come in and fix my people. Now in Texas, we use the word fix, yeah. you know, so they, so they, they, their thought is that it's their employees that need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, I mean, the sad truth is the leader is the one that needs to be fixed. Yeah. And I have to, I have to help them look in the mirror mm -hmm. to see uh, the real truth 
that they are the ones that need to be fixed before we can do anything else. Yeah. If, if I if I can't help that leader uh, get past that, I I, I can't help them. Uh, because if they think it's their people's problems, yeah, uh, then I, I can't help them. Yeah, because um, I mean, uh, it's uh, human nature to always uh, think and say that the other person is the one who is in the wrong, is the one that is not doing things right. So exactly, I, I won't ask you to come and fix me in order that uh, the things that are around me can be fixed. I will ask you to come and help me fix that uh, all over. So, so I, I understand that and we get that, that um, many leaders have that challenge of thinking that it's the things that are the problems, the products that are the problem is the employees that are not doing their work. And, and how do you get them I mean, how do you come to convince them that they are the ones who need the fixing? Well, uh, it, <laughs> it's not easy. You <laughs> yeah. know, I've just learned to ask very, uh, uh, a lot, lots of questions mm -hmm. uh, to help uncover. Uh, actually, uh, I'm helping them uncover the real truth yeah because for me to just stand there and say you're the problem is not going to go over well mm -hmm. so uh i have to you know take them through a process and sometimes it takes more than uh, one meeting mm -hmm. with them to help them understand that they need to be open to change uh you know their leadership style uh, and because so many, I'll be honest with you, so many of them are, there's a big difference between a leader and a manager. Yeah. Lead, leaders lead people. Mm -hmm. Managers manage the things of the business. Yeah. And it's not either or, I mean, you need both. Yeah. Uh, you need both leaders and manager. And I, you know, uh, I was very strong in leadership, but I knew I had to surround myself with excellent managers mm -hmm. because they did a better job than I did at managing the things of the business. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we, we use a term that I actually have in the book called on and in. Okay. And uh what we mean by that is to work on your business while you're working in your business. Ah. And, and what I have found uh, is that 85% uh, of people that identify as leaders, we, I'm, I'm using leaders in a general term here, but are working as hard as they can every day working in the business mm -hmm. and they don't spend any time working on the business yeah there's so there's only a small number of of leaders that are working on the business while they're working in the business and it, a lot comes to uh i speak to so many leaders that are so focused on uh the urgent things and not the important things mm -hmm. And even in people in their, in our personal lives, we, we seem to, you know, the, the fire that's burning in front of us right now is an urgent thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So we just get really focused on it. Okay. Well, uh, we seem to, that seems to consume all of our time and we have no time left over to focus on what's really, really important. Mm-hmm. So I, so I, you know, part of this, once the leader uh, finally begins to see that Bobby, uh, I'm open to change my changing in my leadership style mm -hmm. and, and Anthony, it, it really kind of starts with uh, what I share with these leaders that made our culture so unique. Mm -hmm. Uh, is, you know, let's take like the traditional organization chart that's in a, in a business. 
you know, where the boss is at the top and then they got a leadership team and it just keep, you know, supervisors and goes to like frontline people are at the bottom of the organization chart. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we had that in our company because people needed to understand uh, roles and responsibility. But the attitude, and this goes, I mean, Anthony, we're talking about going all the way back to the 1980s. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, Anthony, I don't know if you were even born yet, you know, <laughs> uh, yet then. So, uh, but uh, uh, I took that traditional organization chart and turned mm -hmm. it upside down. Okay. And I put me at the bottom of the organization chart. Mm -hmm. And I took on the attitude that I was there to serve and equip and to develop the leadership team. They knew that it was their responsibility to serve and equip and develop, you know, the people that reported to them all the way uh, to the top of the organization. Mm -hmm. And so the frontline people were the ones at the top of the organization chart. And even above that was the customer. Yeah. So everyone learning how to work together and serving each other uh, as a team, eventually the customer is the one's going to get served with, you know, premier service. Yeah. And, and, and uh, we had a, the, the on and in that I mentioned, we actually had a physical button in our company called on and in, okay. but we also had another physical button called inside outside. Mm -hmm. And now this is not in the book, but this is just, this is something extra, you know, here, okay. but uh, what that inside outside, it, it, the, the phrase that came with it is our service to our external customer mm -hmm. can only be as good as our service to each other internally. Wow. Mm -hmm. In other words, we taught our people that how to serve each other internally. Okay. So that internally, so externally, we're going to be able to take care of the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an inside outside. That's really what, you know, the, the button was, you know, that's re and we actually misspell the word intentionally, the word inside, it was the letter in letter in with the, you know, inside <coughs> outside. Okay. So, but what it was, we taught our people how to see, uh, who their internal customer was inside the company. Ah. <clears throat> and um, I, I, how I, uh, the first time I introduced this, and this was in the 1990s, that's a long time ago. A long time, long time. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, what I used, a, a, what I call a baton exercise. Mm hmm and uh, one, of, uh, one of the key leaders in the company helped me design a, a baton. You know, a baton is yeah. like in a, in a relay race, you know, like he passed the baton, mm -hmm. you know, to the next runner and, you know, you keep running around the track, uh, you know, so you complete whatever the distance is in that race. Mm -hmm. But this, I tell you what, this, baton would it, it 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 was probably the ugliest baton you've ever seen in your whole life <laughs> right and and what 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 they did they took it, it's kind of embarrassing for me to describe it how ugly it was okay. but but uh they took uh you know on toilet tissue the rolls you know the the cardboard rolls they took two cardboard rolls put mm -hmm. them together and wrapped them in duct tape. Okay. And uh, on the ends were the ugliest streamers of different colors on both ends. Mm -hmm. So the way we helped our people understand how, you know, 
you know, everybody in the company, you have your own job to do. Yeah. But you're also interconnected with everyone else mm -hmm. in the company. And, and what, what I was observing and what I see in a lot of businesses today is people work in silos. In other words, they, it's like blind, blinders. They, they say, okay, I'm just doing my job. I don't care what all this other stuff's going on, but I sure wish they would do it. The other people talking about blaming the, the other people in the company, I wish they would do a better job. Okay. And, and uh, but what we helped our people learn is uh, when I did this baton exercise, I would have, you know, mo in most businesses, it starts with a sale. Nothing happens until somebody sells something. Mm -hmm. So I took like a, someone in sales, I started with them with the baton and I asked them to stand up and walk across the room to, for example, to uh, uh, operations. Uh, and because what's, what's going on is the salespeople are saying, well, the people in operations are not delivering what the customer, what I've told them the customer is looking for. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, operations people are saying, well, the salesman, if they would do a better job in the information they gave us, uh, I, we could deliver, uh, what, what they promised the customer. You, you can see the arguments going back and forth. Yeah. And, uh, of course operations, when they got through with the job, then they pass it on to accounting, you know, uh, or bookkeeping and some organizations for them to take care of billing the customer, you, you know, so, but everybody is typically living in these silos and they're not thinking how we all play on the same team. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like in team sports, uh, you, you, you can tell, uh, uh on it, let, let's take like, you know, right now in, in the United States, uh, football is a big thing. Yeah. And, and you can just imagine that, uh, you know, that uh, somebody on the team, you know, that's playing a, a particular role, blame someone else on the team, not doing their job and, you know, guarding, you know, guarding the, the quarterback or, you, you know, you could just go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. But one thing I've learned is in business, do you have a, a, do, do you have individuals on a team? This is kind of a play on words, so you have to listen real close. Do you have individuals on a team or a team of individuals? You have individuals on a team or a team of, of individuals. It, there's a huge gap between those two. Yeah. A and uh, what happens that you, I, I see this often in, in professional sports mm -hmm. is that when you have, a, I'm talking about team professional sport, okay. when you have several people, uh, you know, like in football, you've got 11 players on the, on the field at a time. Yeah. But if each one of those 11 players are more interested in them, in themselves, they're individual, they're on this team. There, there's 11 of them out there, mm -hmm. but they're all more interested in themselves, not the best, what's best for the team. For the team, yeah. But, and, and, and those people, they'll win games, but they're never gonna win the championship. Mm -hmm. But the team, the, the, the professional, let's continue it on by football, the ones that, play as a team and they're all working <clears throat> for the same uh, objectives together as a team, regardless of the role they have, they're mm -hmm. there to help each other. Uh, they, they're still individuals, but they're there to play for the whole team. Yeah. 
And that's where you get team of individuals. And they're going to, those teams are the ones that will come closest or sometimes will even uh, win the championship. Yeah. And there's something here I want us to get very clear. When you teach the employees to serve one another, serve each other, in what areas? I mean, is it only, I mean, if you have a product, you're serving the other one based on the products that you're producing or a service that you're giving, or you are serving one another even outside of the work environment. I mean, family issues and which areas? Well, it, it, it's, it's fascinating you're asking, if I understand your question, is that when people begin to uh, learn how to serve each other internally, mm -hmm. it spills over into their personal relationships. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of these people, you know, some of our employees had relationships outside of work, mm -hmm. you know. But it also spills over in their family and their family relationships. And if I might share this, uh, it is that it, it's a really, it's a demonstration of God's love in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And people are really hungry for that mm -hmm. because they can't find it anyplace else. Yeah. It, the basis of, of, you know, me turning the organization chart upside down. It's, it's what Jesus said to his disciples. I come to serve and not be served. Oh yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it makes sense when uh, all the employees uh, serve one another and have that mentality that uh, for me to be leading, I need to be the one who is serving and, es and especially in the leadership team. Yeah. Well, just think about this. Yeah, the traditional organization chart, what it tells the employees that that's all they know, it tells the employees they're there to serve who? Mm -hmm. the, the person at the top yeah. of the organization chart, mm -hmm. not serve each other, not even serve the customer. Yeah. And, and so many business leaders I talk to, uh, the reason why they think it's their employees that are the problem Mm -hmm. It's because the employees are supposed to be there to serve the boss at the top of the organization chart. Mm. Yeah. And in your book, you talk about uh, two common leadership problems. I mean, that may what we are talking about could be falling in one of the uh, leadership problems. Which are these two leadership problems, the main ones? Well, <laughs> uh, I tell you what, I went to Anthony. I, this was a school of hard knocks for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Anthony, this goes all the way back to uh, 1989. That's well, a long time ago. A long time. It's a long time. Yeah. Well, prior to 1989, I was one of those leaders that when I, I, in my company, you know, you mentioned about me being an entrepreneur. Well, I was Mr. Idea Man. I was the visionary in our company. Mm -hmm. and, and whenever I got an idea on my own, I would go and come up with all of the questions mm -hmm. uh, that dealt with that idea that I had. I would do, uh, and I would come up with all these questions on my own. Yeah. I would, uh, I, I would, uh, do all the research on my own mm -hmm. and I'd come up with all of the answers on my own. Yeah. Then, uh, what I was doing, one of the leadership problems that I'm talking about here is, is the Lone Ranger mm -hmm. leadership. Mm -hmm. Then after I came up with this great idea and uh, come up with, you know, how we're going to do it and all that. That's when I went to our leadership team and ba I, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but basically what I said, look what I've done for you. And it never did go over well. Yeah. And I, 
I mean, I was at sometimes would take, it was, I would spend months in some cases, years to persuade the leadership team that this is a good idea. We need to, we need to start providing this service or this product uh, in the marketplace, mm -hmm. but it, it, it just never did go over well. And in some cases we never did, you know, never did implement things because the leadership team, you know what they were saying? What? It, it, hey, this is Bobby's idea. This, I, I don't have any part in this. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads to the second leadership problem, mm -hmm. which uh, I call it the iceberg of ignorance. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's really based on a Japanese uh, researcher mm -hmm. that found that only 4% of the organization frontline problems, in other words, what the people on the front line were experiencing every day, mm -hmm. only 4% was known by the, the guy or gal at the top of the organization or the, or the management, the top management. Mm -hmm. And, and only 9% of the middle managers knew what was really, really going on on the front line. Yeah. Uh, you know, part of this, uh, so what happened is the people at the top of the organization who are making all of the decisions for the mm -hmm. whole organization don't really know what is really, really going on on, on the uh, front line every day that they're faced with. It's quite interesting that, uh, that in, uh, see, see, part of this is, uh, CEOs, presidents, business leaders, uh, they are driven. They're driving as hard as they can. They're driving for results. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it, the, the, the people that work there, I mean, they want to achieve results, yeah. but they have other greater needs. <coughs> Uh, and Gallup, you may be familiar with Gallup, they're a research firm. Mm -hmm. They did a survey, massive survey, uh, with over 85,000 companies yeah. and over 1 million employees. And guess what they found that the employees, we're talking about the regular, you know, John Joe, Jane, Doe, you know, on the front line, mm -hmm. there were five things that they were saying they wish that they got from their organization. And by the way, we're talking about engagement, yeah, engaging with your employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sad thing that came out of that uh, Gallup survey is only 33% of these uh 85, you know, over 85,000 companies, mm -hmm. only 33% of them were really engaging their employees. In other words, they really look forward to coming and work every day. Mm -hmm. So you've got 67% of the employees that are, are coming to work every day, they're, they are disengaged. In other words, they're just clocking in, clocking out, clocking mm -hmm. in, clocking out. I'm just doing my job, give me my paycheck. You know, th that's all they, or they are totally disengaged. In other words, they're walking the hallway, speaking bad about the boss, about the company. Yeah. So we're talking about 67% of these employees are either disengaged or totally disengaged. That's not good. Yeah. So what they were saying they really were looking for is these five things is, uh, do, does this organization, I wish they would demonstrate that they care for, for me as an individual. Mm -hmm. That's first one. The second was, uh, I, 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 I wanted to contribute toward the organization's goals. Mm -hmm. 
the the third thing they came up with is uh is this culture that we have here is it one that i feel like like i really belong mm -hmm. that i really belong here the fourth was uh is that is the environment here is provides for constant learning so i can do the best job that i can do mm -hmm. and the fifth one was does this organization stand for something that I feel good about or something that I can support? Yeah. Now, to be honest with you, uh, those things are really not hard to solve, but that is the reason why so many of these companies, 67% of them had employees that were, you know, disengaged or totally disengaged mm -hmm. because they weren't receiving those things. And uh, so when, what I, going back to 1989, mm -hmm. uh, they was, uh, they was a guy that mentored me. Uh, he started mentoring with me and he did a confidential survey. You would call them today, uh, like a 360 evaluation. In other yeah. words, he uh, uh, did a survey on me as the leader. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when the results came back, it was all confidential. I don't know who said what, uh, basically what they, they were saying, Bobby, when you get an idea, come to us before you make up your mind, we want to help you. Mm -hmm. Because what I was doing before, because I did, came up with all the questions on my own, did all the research, came up with all of the answers, is they, they didn't even know I was even doing any of that. Mm -hmm. So they had no ownership in this great idea. And they want to feel as a part of the company. Exactly. When you have a business or a, a company that you're trying to bring up, all the employees want to feel like they are part of it so that they can, uh, I mean, they, they, they can always be proud to say, I'm working for this and that company. Yes. So, and, so, and yeah, mm -hmm. and this is when we, after this, when I finally had this aha moment, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'll be honest with you, when I heard the results of the survey, it made me mad. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking, well, they don't understand me. They don't appreciate all that hard work I did for them because I thought they didn't have time. They weren't even interested in, you know, working on a project like that. I, it, I mean, you, it's kind of like, you know, like we were talking about earlier about blaming everybody, you know, yeah. but good thing I had a night to sleep on. Mm -hmm. And the next morning I woke up and I started thinking, you know, I, I don't like what I heard, but I, I really need to listen to the results and, and, and our people because, uh, they want to help me. Yes. And, and, uh, so the horrible truth came to me. And I finally learned, which we end up having another button, you know, talking about buttons, we call a one, two, three. Yeah. And uh, what I learned is that at the beginning of the decision making process and before I made a decision mm -hmm. is that I would engage our team uh, in, in asking three questions three question is who can help me make a better decision mm -hmm. who will be impacted by that decision mm -hmm. and uh who and and who will have to carry out that decision yeah and uh got them started engaging them in that er i mean the early stages of the decision making process by engaging them and, and they came away over and over after many years. That's when they, you know, I said earlier about after I sold the company, you could walk around the company and they thought they owned the company. Then, you know, then Bobby Albert, it's because, uh, because of them being engaged in the process, 
they took on an ownership and they they actually got better results than I did with with me trying to force it on people. Yeah, I get that. Now, um, at what point did you write now the book we are talking about, Truth, True North? Oh, at what point did I what? Did you write that? Did you did you write True North? At what point did you write True North? Did I uh, that I wrote the uh, book? The book. At what point did you write the book? In the growing of your company, after you've sold your company, at what point? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I took uh, many years of stories in in our company yeah and i took uh you know things i learned in in our company and i uh so uh, you know after i sold a company is uh after i published my first book the true north business was my second book yeah and I, uh, what I did, I picked up, uh, some, I, I gave, uh, some leadership principles mm -hmm. that are at the early part of the book. And then the remaining of the book <clears throat> are, uh, three leadership practices. Uh, one of them being the on and in the other one had to do with wow. And that was another button in our company. Yeah. Uh, which the two, the, the two W's stood for the first W stood for why we exist. That's our purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the O didn't mean anything. And uh, the second W was uh, where are we going? That's our vision mm -hmm. in our company. Yeah. When we entered this going back into the early 1990s that we introduced this and um and the the third uh, main part of the book was this one two three, which I just shared with you. Yeah, good. So, whom do you wish now to read uh, True North at this point? Uh, who, who who exactly would you recommend to read the True North? Well, it it would you know any business leader or you know business executive the you know it doesn't make any difference of the size of you know of their company uh it you know e anybody in a leadership capacity i i use the term business could be uh, a a pastor of a church could be a, a leader of a nonprofit could be a leader of a educational institution of some type uh, is that anybody in a leadership capacity uh, could learn some principles and practices uh, that I've seen. I mean, you know, with me having over 40 years experience uh, as a CEO of, of our company uh, that I've been able to, share stories of i mean real live stories of mm -hmm. things that work there's this stuff is not theory i mean yeah. this is real real life uh things that took place yes and we can imagine with those uh, years of experience 40 years you must be having quite a number of the stories oh yeah in, in fact i'm glad that i've written about all of this uh, i actually i've I've written uh, uh, close to about 300 uh, uh, blogs and I've taken that. That's kind of been my discipline to write uh, these books Yeah. Uh, because I don't really consider myself a, a writer, uh, but I've got uh, people take my, my Texas language and put it into some good, you know, English. <laughs> uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, but uh I, I've I'm just enjoying this living this second half of life where I can share these uh, principles and practices and how to help uh, a leader uh, not only grow them 
uh, but to how they can grow their people and then they can grow their business. Because most leaders, they are focused on growing the business. They need to be looking at growing themselves so they can grow their people, then they can grow their business. Oh, and that's a good one. So grow yourself, grow your people, and that's when you can then grow your business. Yes. That's, that's wonderful. And uh, if I may ask you, um, now that you still, I mean, you're sharing those stories and you tell us you've had so many stories that you've put in blog posts and articles, which could have been your most favorite up to now? Oh, wow, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps maybe I can share this uh, is uh, one of the things I, I teach and actually it's in my first book more, but I do bring it up into this book is, uh, you know, I've mentioned so much about the importance of workplace culture mm -hmm. is that culture is the fruit and not the goal. Mm -hmm. And I come across so many leaders that have made the culture of their company their goal. And the way they do it, they think in their mind, if I just pay my people more, if I just uh, uh, you know, provide them with all the food they wanna eat and all the beverage they wanna drink, uh, if I bring in some ping pong tables or, you know, they, they've what they've done they think if they do those things mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about things here yeah is that their people would be excited to come to work every day mm -hmm. but but they've made culture a goal and this is a reason why it comes back to what we discussed earlier is focusing on the uh, what's important in in leading your people, what is important? And that's the thing I try to help them learn. It's what is important. If they'll focus on that, and if they do well at that, and trust that if they do well at that, that the fruit is, is going to be a workplace culture that is going to, I mean, you're going to have employees that are thriving mm -hmm. and you're going to see extraordinary, I mean, extraordinary profits. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. So it's been a great time that you shared with us and uh, True North and would ask everybody who's listening to go and get True North to get all the principles and uh, culture that we are talking about and the virtues that I explained there to grow your business, to be a leader in your organization, wherever you are. So uh, it's been quite an honor. But before you go, we always ask you to leave us with a parting shot, something that you'd like us to remember about you or about this book specifically. Well, if I may offer a free gift uh, to your audience, yeah, and, and it, it's a it's a cult, you know, a workplace culture assessment tool, mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, it's it's fairly the link to that is fairly simple. It's uh, bobbyalbert.com/slash mm -hmm. culture checkup. It, it's treated like one word, bobbyalbert.com slash culture checkup. And um, I'll, uh, uh, I'd, I'd love for people to be able to take the assessment tool so they can see, you know, how well their workplace culture is really, really working. And, you know, Anthony, if I can just come back to this is, reading the true north business even though it's we're talking about you know business practice you know principles you know leadership but these leadership principles and practices they apply to how you run your personal life mm -hmm. and and how you can lead your family uh to be a very productive family as well yeah family is a team also 
I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we are all in it together, and each for each of us uh, uh, have our own part to play, and we've got to play it best of our, with the best of our ability. And uh, remembering that we are a leader to to serve, not to be served. Exactly. So, so those are principles that apply in our relationships, in our marriages. And so we are very glad that you are sharing them with us now and uh, we'll go and apply them now since we are uh, uh, at the prime of uh, making things happen. Yes. Yeah. So once again, thank you very much, Bobby. We really appreciate you being on our show. And uh, well, it's been, yeah, it's been yeah. a pleasure to be here today. And we look forward to reading uh, your book in its entirety. And uh, it's, it's been quite an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.